From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Welcome once again, Eric Atkinson here. First up today, a longtime USDA researcher based here at K-State, John Fellers, will discuss the series of developments that have led to the complete sequencing of the bread wheat genome. That was announced last week. It's big news, and he talks about what this means for accelerated wheat variety improvement. Also, K-State's Anita Dilley will provide an update on her research with various cover crops as instruments for crop weed control. She talks about how several cover crop options are grading out well as part of a comprehensive weed management program. And later on, with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. Plus more right here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you aboard once more. Huge news coming out of Kansas State University and uh, other parties involved just last week where the complete reference genome of bread wheat has now been sequenced. Several researchers have been involved in this sequencing effort, including our guest now who goes way back on this. John Fellers is with us. He's a USDA plant molecular biologist based here in Manhattan, works in collaboration with the plant pathology department at K-State. So this is being touted as a gigantic landmark in wheat genetics advancement. Is that fair to characterize it that way, John? Yes. it's. Uh, some people would say it would be almost an undertaking like going to the moon, as large as when we first started approaching this. The wheat genome is huge. And when we're talking about genome, it's all of the DNA in the cells. So the human genome uh, was the first one really to be done. It contains about 23 chromosomes. The wheat genome is 17 billion letters of DNA, and it's wrapped up in 21 chromosomes. It's five times that of the human genome? Yes, it's huge, yeah. Yeah. And so another issue is that inside the DNA, there is just a lot of repetitive DNA, little pieces of DNA that jump around. Well, what's happened is these things have caused the wheat genome to grow. Well, When you're trying to sequence wheat DNA, what you do is you take small pieces of DNA, and it's four letters, A, T, G, and C. And so when you start putting these things together, if you have lots of repetitive DNA, it's like looking at a 2,000-piece puzzle when it's all colored red. (laughs) Okay? I mean, they all look the same, but yeah, they might fit together a little bit different, but trying to put all this together has been a daunting task, and we just hadn't had the technology or the computing power until the last few years to do this justice. And talk about what has happened here then in the technological advancements that have opened the door toward this full sequencing. Sure. So when I first started in graduate school in the early to mid-90s, when we would do a DNA sequence, try to sequence some DNA, we had to use these acrylamide gels. And with each sample, we could we would be lucky if we could get 200 letters of DNA on a run, and it would take a week. You would run the gel, put it on a piece of x-ray film, you let it sit there over the weekend, and hopefully it worked. Mm. That's how a, a lot of the early uh, sequencing was done. Then in the late 90s, a new technology came along. It was developed by a group in Stanford where they could put uh, colored on each one of the letters of DNA. So we had blue, red, green, and yellow for each one of the letters. And so then you could run these slab gels and use a laser and scan them. And now on each slab gel, you could do 96 samples at a time and get about three to 400 bases. So that was a big step forward, except that you could only run two gels a day. 
there again, you were only getting roughly 40,000 letters per run, and each one of those runs was costing over $1,000. Wow. Then in 1999, when I came here, the Kansas Wheat Commission decided they wanted to fund DNA sequencing. A new DNA sequencer, it was fully automated, had come out. Uh, USDA had bought 12 and scattered them around. One was in California, and it was doing sequencing wheat RNA. And so the Wheat Commission placed one here, and we started doing wheat DNA sequencing here. This was the cutting-edge technology it was of the, the day. Yeah, right. That's right. And so the machine itself was $300,000. Mm. Each sequencing run on this machine, even though it was a step forward, we could do it every two hours. And we would get 100 samples, and we could do 700 letters per sample. So you're still looking at 70000 per run. And it was $1,000 to $1,500. So, so it was laborious and costly. Exactly. And so in 2004, Bikram and the Kansas Wheat Commission had hired Kelly Eversall, who was a big proponent for the corn genome project, had experience there. So they had hired her to get the ball rolling on the wheat genome. So we met in Washington. And I had done some early work with this sequencer and showed how – how much repetitive DNA was in wheat. We had sequenced a few small pieces of about 100,000 letters. And in the process, we, we uh, cloned the domestication gene in wheat, and we cloned the uh, LR21, which is the first leaf rust resistance gene. But these were eight- or nine-year projects to clone this one gene. And each one of those small pieces of DNA were costing twenty to $30,000 just in materials and time. So uh, we presented our data, and it was decided that they were going to sequence the whole genome. Uh, well, then Kansas State had, through Bikram Gill and his work, had developed a set of chromosome stocks where they had literally lopped off pieces of the chromosome arms. And there was a researcher in Hungary that had modified a chromosome sorter that would literally go in and, based on the size of the chromosome, shoot it off into one tube, the rest of the longer chromosomes would go here. Hmm. And then uh, just in the last few years, the sequence technology that we have now, now we can take a leaf from the plant, take it in the lab, we can cut it up, we can isolate the DNA, we don't have to do any cloning. We just do a reaction that costs about $100. And this sequencer now that we have is the size of our harmonica. And it works with a laptop. And for $1,000, I can sequence 8 billion letters of DNA at one time. So it's it's now affordable and it it, expedites the process. Exactly. Uh, But I think think one of the biggest thing was was that these repetitive pieces of DNA, there's over 90% of the wheat genome is that. So to try to develop the computing power and the computer programs to handle that wasn't there. And that was our biggest, biggest issue. And so uh, a group called NRG out of Israel uh, developed a software that works with these really large genomes like we and was able to piece together things very well. And so starting from 2004 till this last week, the group finally met, met their goal. And this wouldn't have happened without the Kansas wheat producers. Uh, because they drove this. They were the ones behind it, pushing it. They got us all together. They they really had the dream and knew. That's the cool thing about the Kansas wheat producers since I've been here for 20 years. And being a farm kid myself, a, a wheat grower myself, they understand their investment. They understand what they get out of it. And so I really want to thank them, and especially all of us in the wheat world, want to thank them for their leadership in all this. So, John, here we are with the genome sequenced. It's understood that this is going to open the door for more rapid improvement of wheat varieties. How do you see this manifesting itself? How much more rapidly can we see things moving as far as improved wheat lines? Okay. A wheat breeder in past years had a trait that he would want, but didn't know the gene. And so what uh, someone like Alan Fritz would do, he would take pollen from one plant, pollen from the next plant, and it would be 15 years before that variety or something from that cross came out of it that he could release that met all the things that he was looking for, all the traits. And so, but now we're starting to understand the DNA responsible for plant height, for 
pre-harvest sprouting. Any or, trait. Any trait. Now, some of them are more difficult, like yield, because those are several genes coming together. But simple genes like disease resistance and things like that, we can find those. Now what's going to allow it to happen is that we can go in and we can take a cross and we can go in and look at the individuals and find the letter changes that we associate with the trait. Say at this one position on chromosome 3B, we find a T and that T is associated with resistance to fusarium. In other plants that are not resistant, they have an A. Now we can say, okay, we look for this T in all these progeny. And, and so then Alan can throw those out. This could, when put into place, and if we get enough markers with all the traits that we're interested in, and it's the same technology they're doing with corn, is they can make a cross, look at the individuals, find all these letter changes, and within just a few years have a plant that has everything that they want. And when you say a few years, as opposed to 10, 15, 15 years. Yeah, we're looking at three be. to four years, you know. Uh, in the corn industry, when they have everything built up and the companies have the money to do it, you know, they can rapidly do it. But we, even within the wheat community, we can shorten it to five to eight years. The importance of this can't be overstated, can it? No, no. John? No, I mean, when we first looked at this, we were looking at a 500 to a billion dollar project. You know, people were telling us, no, you can't do it. The corn folks are saying, no, you can't do it. The human folks says, you're crazy. And there were people, like I say, the Wheat Commission kept pushing this. And it's not some imaginable thing now. I can actually go to the computer and actually find that piece of DNA that I'm interested in and uh, start to work with it. John, congratulations to you for being involved in this for so long and uh, seeing it to fruition and uh, looking forward to what more comes of this work ahead. Yeah, Thanks for thank coming you. over and sharing the story with you us right here. He is a USDA plant molecular biologist who is based here in Manhattan, works, of course, closely with Kansas State University, which in collaboration with the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium have now completely Sequence the genome of bread wheat. John Fellers on Agriculture Today. We'll have more in a moment on this. The K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. And here, we'll draw from a topic that is making the agenda at a number of the K-State fall field days around Kansas. The use of cover crops, highly popular topic, and specifically here as part of a weed management protocol. Along with us once again is weed ecologist Anita Dilley of the Department of Agronomy at K-State, and she conducts research in this area, has for a number of years. In fact, Anita, it goes back almost a decade now, this particular research principle, right? Yes, it has been. We've been looking at how we can include cover crops in our cropping system, specifically no-till cropping systems throughout the state for weed management. And so we've started a long-term research project at Ashland Bottoms where we have incorporated that, um, especially in our wheat fallow period. Once the wheat comes off, there's a lot of weeds that come in there and there's got to be something different we can do than just trying to spray them out with herbicides, especially when they've become resistant. Mm -hmm. And can we use cover crops in there? And um, that led to many other studies where we have learned how to incorporate cover crops at different stages in between folks' Um, crop rotation sequence. So if it's a corn bean rotation, how do we fit that over the winter time or through a fallow period? There are all sorts of combinations here. <laughs> You've discovered that in you know, 10 yeah, years' time. There is definitely a diversity. Um, as I give these uh, presentations at um, either extension meetings, field days, I always start out with, I don't have the recipe for you because each farmer has an, their own unique scenario, the weeds that they're worried about and their crop rotation. So I usually give them a list of questions to ponder to highlight what those principles are to be able to think about how to put a cover crop into their system if that's something that they want to do. Well, let's just write 
right here. Walk through some of those key questions uh, and what producers need to contemplate as they think about whether a cover crop will benefit them as a weed control tool and then what cover crops would suit the need. Sure. As we think about cover crops, they have a lot of different potential benefits and they also have a number of costs. So I always ask the farmer to think back on what do they hope to get out of that cover crop. And if it's weed suppression, then we need to think about how we uh, select the right cover crop to produce as much biomass as we can, because that's what's really competing against either the weed as it's emerging and coming out of the ground, that we want the cover crop instead of the weed growing, and then the potential to um, be there um, and competing with that weed for light, water, nutrients, and preventing the weed from really even growing The other key question to ask is what weed are they going after and when does that particular weed emerge? And so is it a winter annual? A lot of the growers will mention mare's tail, horseweed um, as one of those that will be coming up here soon um, in the fall. And so really looking at what fall cover crops we might need. The other weeds that a lot of people are focusing on, of course, are the pigweed species, either water hemp um, in the eastern half of the state or palmer amaranth, which tends to be in the southern half and, and almost throughout the state. And those ones tend to come up uh, early May into June, July. They keep coming. And so we need to be thinking of cover crops that are appropriate to get early spring growth on those. And then also they keep coming up into wheat stubble. So that's, again, where that wheat stubble cover crop opportunity comes in to to go after the pigweed species that we're worried about. If one establishes that cover crop in a timely way, they generally can be competitive with all of these weeds, can they not? They can be very well. Um, We've done a number of studies. One, for example, is with no-till on the plains and the Kansas Soybean Commission. They were very interested in on-farm studies looking at could these cover crops provide weed suppression? And so some farmers um, that I visited with left an area bare compared to the rest of it in cover crop, and I went out and surveyed what their weed populations look like, you know, how many weeds, what weeds, and how big were they, so their biomass. And what we saw across a number of farmers' fields and even in the research studies is that we could cut the number of weeds in half. So there were only 50% of the weeds, whatever mixture of weeds there were in the field, and then the size of those weeds were dropped by 95%. Mm. And so we had fewer weeds, smaller weeds um, that were growing in the cover crop compared to if I didn't do anything. So sure, a herbicide would potentially control them, but then I still don't have any cover there. And so those other benefits of a cover crop can be added in. But it's so much easier to control fewer weeds and smaller weeds with a herbicide in combination than with that cover crop that we have a lot better success with that. And that was consistent just to see that reduction in number and size of weeds by using those cover crops. There's a great lot of talk, as you well know, Anita, about cover crop mixes or blends. Do they sport an advantage over straight cover crops singularly at all, or does that vary across conditions? What? Um, It'll vary across conditions. And also, this is where I ask a grower, what is their goal again? Um, If they are after weed suppression, then I really want something that'll produce biomass. Um, So often a grass cereal kind of species or in the wheat fallow, it may be something like a sorghum sudan that really puts on size, will capture the sunlight, not let it get down to the soil surface where the weed seeds are trying to come up and grow. That kind of biomass really does the most benefit to competing against the weeds. Um, You'll see a lot of folks with a lot of diverse mixtures, blends of the grasses and radishes or legumes. But often with weed management, a legume, we can't keep it. It's not growing in the field long enough to be able to get all the benefit that we want out of it. And some of that seed's quite expensive. And so um, if we knew that it was going to be out there for a much longer period of time and you would get the growth and the benefit, sure. But from a weed standpoint where we're trying to you know, have something grow quick and beat the weeds, which grow really fast too, sometimes a legume isn't the best thing to get in there. So we're still exploring which ones might work for that, but they tend to be more perennial and they just need more time to grow. So we don't get as much benefit out of them. A lot of interest in diverse radish, and turnips, and, and other plants in that group. And we're seeing some benefit from that because you can get even though they're not very tall, they cover the ground pretty quick with their broad leaves that they have. And so we see some benefit from that. But often we're trying to get something that'll grow through the winter, compete against those winter annuals that may be there early in the spring or something early in the spring. Mm-hmm. A spring set of cover crops, though, that really worked well was like a spring oat 
and often in a mixture with a spring pea. If you put enough of those spring peas in there and you get a nice environment, that's a real dense, very competitive set of cover crops that really seem to work well in our environment. If we got good rains in March, April, you can get a really awesome cover crop that'll be there and compete against those weeds that are coming up right before soybeans, say, in the spring. Yeah, everything's contingent upon adequate moisture, right. of course. <laughs> yeah, so out of two-year studies, one's great, and then the next year it's like, shoot, we didn't get any rain. <laughs> One facet of cover crop management for weed control is what to do with that cover crop once you approach planting time, the uh, cash crop that you're going with, how to terminate that cover crop in in an effective way. That's actually the uh, centerpiece of current work that you're doing in field. Correct. Earlier this spring, there was a lot of folks asking questions about when do I terminate this cover crop relative to planting my row crop, so soybeans. A lot of recommendations um, recommend, you know, the two weeks before planting just to really make sure that you've got good control of that cover crop, that the residue is laying down, and then be able to plant into it. But that leaves a, an open window of time for some of those weeds to, to potentially sneak through that um, residue layer. And so we were observing growers that were either spraying just a couple days before they would plant so the cover crop was still standing and could get through there with their planter but it was already you know on its way out because of the herbicide treatment to terminate it or do they plant green have it not even been exposed to a herbicide yet and then spray it afterwards and so I really wanted to explore that question both for corn or for beans when do I terminate it do I do it two weeks ahead couple days ahead or afterwards. And then we are following up um, on the weed, level of weed control that that provided as well as just the crop growth. How well did that crop establish? Was it impacted by having those different times of termination? So I don't have yield data yet, mm-hmm. but that's what we're really looking forward to to get this fall and just to see what kind of impact those different termination timings have. But we've got these studies all the way from uh, Oakley Hoxie area through down to Girard, wow. uh, Kansas, so across the state just to see what kind of things that might do for us. And any presuppositions as to what you might find from that work, or is it an open book right now? Well, I've uh, pulled my graduate student for some data, and one of our locations near Clay Center, it was a rye cover crop before beans, and when it was terminated at about 9 to 10 inch height, that was two weeks beforehand, um, the student went out later to survey for uh, Palmer amaranth, and they found 16 weeds per unit area. Went into the later terminated one right before planting. The rye was at about boot stage, down to six plants that they found in those plots. And then terminated after planting, they found no Palmer amaranth in those plots. And so just that window of that rye already dying and and opening up the canopy and not putting on that much growth allowed more pigweed to come in than if we delayed it. There was a little bit of shorter beans in that later rye that got terminated afterwards. Um, So we're still following up on just what kind of impact that may have on, on yield. But from a weed control standpoint, it just looked amazing. We were dropping those potential pigweeds that could grow in there by waiting longer. Lots of questions, of course, and uh, so uh, so individual they are mm-hmm. about cover crop opportunities. K-State has provided good information to use as reference there, Anita. Yes. We've got a number of folks looking at multiple aspects. There's so many different benefits out of cover crops, so really looking at um, all those different components. But if nothing else, um, encourage a grower to try it on a small area because it does take some changes to what they're doing to make sure that it fits into their system. And so always try it on a little bit, see how that fits into their system. You bet. Tap into the information online at the K-State Department of Agronomy website, agronomy.ksu.edu. Also, file your questions through your local Extension Agricultural Agent on cover crop suitability for your cropping system and your growing conditions in your area. And Anita, thank you for the quick briefing, and we'll have you back again soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Weed ecologist, K-State Department of Agronomy, that's Anita Dilley. You're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station.
You're listening to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. Eric Atkinson with you. And next up, today's agricultural news headlines in review, these courtesy in part of DTN. The U.S. and China will hold two days of trade talks starting today in Washington. These sessions will take place between U.S. Treasury Undersecretary David Malpass and Chinese Commerce Vice Minister Wang Xiaowen. Expectations for the talks vary. China expressing hope that the sessions will at least bring some progress. However, President Trump has downplayed the potential for any major developments to emerge from the sessions. He told Reuters he did not anticipate Anticipate much to come from them, saying he also had no time frame for ending the dispute with China. The president was also noncommittal about meeting with President Xi Jinping in November during international events the two are scheduled to take part in. Meanwhile, the talks in Washington also unfold as the U.S. has said it will deploy tariffs on another $16 billion worth of Chinese goods tomorrow, and China has said it will respond in kind with tariffs on that amount of U.S. products. Also, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative is holding six days of hearings that run through this week on imposing tariffs on another $200 billion in Chinese goods. As a program note, on tomorrow's broadcast, we'll have observations on trade and the farm bill. Likewise, from K-State Professor Emeritus of Agricultural Economics, Barry Flinchbaugh, who shared those thoughts at the K-State Cooperative Symposium yesterday. We'll feature those right here tomorrow. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer is calling on the FDA to release the results of its two-year study looking at glyphosate residues in foods. This urging came in response to media coverage of the Environmental Working Group's report, finding that very low levels of the popular herbicide were in oatmeal as well as cereals. The FDA said that between 2016 and 2017, it began preliminary testing of samples of soybeans, corn, milk, and eggs. The agency He said it completed this preliminary testing in fiscal year 2017 with plans to expand the testing to other foods in fiscal year 18. The preliminary results for glyphosate testing showed no pesticide residue violations for glyphosate in all four commodities tested, said the FDA. The agency plans to include its results for glyphosate testing in future reports on pesticide residues. With the 2015 Waters of the U.S., or WOTUS rule, now in effect in half of the country, a number of agriculture and other industry groups are continuing the court fight. The groups have turned to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit in Richmond, Virginia, in an attempt to overturn the South Carolina District Court ruling that threw out the EPA's new rule to delay the implementation of the WOTUS rule by two years. In addition, groups led by the American Farm Bureau Federation, National Cattlemen, Beef Association, National Corn Growers Association, the National Pork Producers Council, and others have asked the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas in Galveston to issue a national injunction on the 2015 rule. In a notice filed with the Texas court earlier, the agriculture groups expressed a sense of urgency to the court about issuing the injunction in light of the decision in South Carolina. Now, back on August 16th, WOTUS took effect in 26 states after a federal judge in South Carolina issued a nationwide injunction on the EPA rule that delayed the implementation of the regulation. That rule remains on hold in 24 states, including Kansas, after a series of district court decisions in North Dakota and Georgia. With that ruling last Thursday, the rule now is in effect in Iowa, Texas, Oklahoma, and 23 other states. Because of the court actions in those other cases, the rule again remains on hold in Kansas, as well as Missouri, Nebraska, and Colorado regionally. Three Kansas ranches are in the running for one of the state's major conservation awards. Todd Domber highlights the stewardship efforts of this year's trio of nominees. Ranchland Trust of Kansas, the Sand County Foundation, and the Kansas Association of Conservation Districts have named finalists for the 2018 Kansas Leopold Conservation Award. The award honors Kansas landowners for achievement in voluntary stewardship and dedication to land, water, and wildlife habitat management on private working land. The finalists are Hamey Family Farm and Ranch at Scott City, owned by Stacy Hamey, Alexander Ranch of Sun City, owned by Ted and Brian Alexander, 
and the Z-Bar Ranch near Lake City owned by Turner Enterprises and managed by Keith and Eva Yearout. Stacy Hamey and his son, Chaston, have been working on the cutting edge of land-friendly farming practices that help their profits, wildlife, and the environment. Cattle are rotationally grazed on land that also serves as habitat for the lesser prairie chicken. Alexander Ranch has successfully used a rotational grazing system for nearly 30 years. The Alexanders have done extensive clearing of eastern red cedar trees to increase native plant and wildlife diversity, including habitat for lesser prairie chickens. Zebar Ranch is managed under a philosophy of economic sustainability and ecological sensitivity with a focus on native species. The ranch raises forage to sustain a 1,200-head bison herd. This year's Kansas Leopold Award will be presented November 19th at the Kansas Association of Conservation Districts Convention in Wichita. The winner will receive $10,000 and a crystal award depicting renowned conservationist Aldo Leopold. I'm Todd Domer. And this reminder... Kansas State University's Southwest Research and Extension Center, just outside of Garden City, will be hosting its 2018 Field Day tomorrow, starting early in the morning. It'll feature field tours, indoor seminars, and seed implement and farm supply company displays. The registration and the vendor exhibits opening at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. The program, highlighting K-State research updates at 9.15, a complimentary lunch will be provided. The field tours will include a look at weed control Control and Irrigated Corn by Randall Curry, Weed Control and Irrigated Grain Sorghum by Vipan Kumar and Randall, an update on Mobile Drip Irrigation by Jonathan Aguilar, also John Holman on Diversified Annual Forage Crop Rotations, and Perspectives on Forbes in Kansas Grasslands by Bob Gillen and Anthony Zukoff. The seminars and insect and pesticide safety, up, uh, safety update provided by K-State's Sarah Zukoff, and there will be a core hour for commercial Pesticide License by Sean Rich of the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Again, no cost to attend and take part, and if you'd like more information, you can go to the website southwest.kstate.edu for more information on the 2018 Fall Field Day at K-State's Southwest Research and Extension Center. That's along Mary Street, just to the east of Garden City. Hope you producers can make it to that great event. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. We can buy container-grown grasses and let our mind blow away. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. On Sunday, here in Manhattan, we enjoyed a good soaking rain. Part of my gutters ran over. That was not because too much rain came down, but because I had not cleaned the gutters. Another job to do. I will put it on my to-do list. I was happy. With the rain. The day before, I mowed the lawn and paths on the hills. While doing the trails, I looked at the native grasses. The leaves were curled up. Even with the few showers we had earlier, the grass stand suffered. It needed rain, much rain. One other thing I noticed that I do have milkweeds, the monarch butterfly likes. That was a good thing to see. Now, they must bloom. Some had started. Saturday afternoon, I went to the farm to check the rain gates there and the pastures. Walking the wooded trail, I walked in the shade. I moved several broken branches which were laying on the ground. 
Walking in the shade of the big oaks and other trees, I suddenly reached the part of the trail which was much brighter. Instead of the dark path, there was as if a path of gold was in front of me. Suddenly, shimmering light was reflected. It was a rich yellow gold that was laying in front of me on my path. I was not surprised as I recognized it for what it was. Golden leaves of the big cottonwood which stands off the road but reaches over the trail with its big branches. And even though its roots must reach a natural spring, which I know is there in the hill, it had lots of leaves after they had colored deep yellow and let loose to drift down, landing on my path. It was a tree's defense against a dry month. Looking up into the crown of the big cottonwood, I could see enough leaves left to complete the season. They will color as fall approaches, and then again turn the old farm track into a golden carpet for me to wander. I'm glad the farm has woods, dense woods. There are the big oak trees growing along the creeks. In the fallen leaves, I see the turkey scratchings, and every now and then I pick up a lost feather. In the woods among the trees, you don't see the flock of birds I've seen ranging on the hay fields after harvesting hay. They must be looking for grasshoppers or other insects in the open. Just as I look, walk in the woods for the trees, individual trees, I like to see the grasses. The trouble with grasses is that you look at the whole range. To see individual grasses or forbs is more difficult. Of course, you quickly recognize tall blue stem or compass plant, and for that matter, buffalo grass. This is the time of the year that the individual grasses do stand out if cattle have not grazed them down. Tall blue stem being a favorite, but my pasture has it. However, there's more little blue stem. Soon the cattle will be moved off, and I will walk the range just to learn what patch burning so far can show me. I will walk the grassland past the old buffalo wallets, and I will think. When my daughter emailed me from Amsterdam that she had bought potted grass at the market to cheer up her balcony, I chuckled. Of course, one or two potted grasses do not make a prairie. However, they do remind one of grasslands, grasslands found the whole world over in Africa, Australia, Argentina, Hungary, and more, all have extensive grassland. And here we can buy container-grown grasses. It's surprising how far the landscape and nursery industry has gone with cultivating beautiful ornamental grasses. I pulled several books off my shelves. A classic is, of course, the Agricultural Yearbook of 1948, simply called Grass. It's one of the classics among the old yearbooks the Department of Agriculture no longer publishes. I also have ornamental grasses for the Midwest. It shows a planting plan for a border of ornamental grasses. When artfully done, that can be a very interesting aspect of the garden. Grasses can be very different. Just look at the different forms. They can be tufted, like someone not combing his hair. They can be mounted, upright, upright but more open, upright and arching, or just arching. Of course, the flowers or seed heads are what makes them stand out, as well as the color of the grass blades. Blue stem is not called blue for nothing. I have a patch of little blue stem, which each year shows itself as an intensely blue color. Each year I say to myself, dig some up and take it home. I've never done it, but I've gone out of my way to look at that patch. When I planted the grass sea oats in my border, 
I did not keep it in a pot with the bottom cut out. I just planted it in the border. It was a sturdy plant, and I knew it would send out runners. Well, it has. It has spread itself. Do I mind? Not really, because I like the plant. But the fact is, some grasses are better controlled and planted in their container or a larger container with the bottom cut off so roots can grow down but not easily sideways. Now or fall is the time to select and to buy the grasses for the border. I'm looking forward to see the seed plumes of Indian grass blowing and moving in the wind again soon. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. That'll do it for our Wednesday edition. Thanks for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.